Okay, I have Omar from Atlanta who has a question. Okay, I am a health major and I study physiology. And your blood flows through your body by the heartbeat from the oxygen that you intake. America runs by financial entities. When are we going to say we're not going to spend a dime in Florida? Stevie Wonder said he's not performing in any state that has a standard ground law like this. So unfortunately, he won't be in Georgia anytime until he fix it either, but he's an example of taking the stand. What would happen if Jay-Z and Beyonce said that? That would be crazy. I cannot make that happen. I can ask. I'm not going to be too presumptuous. Crash here. All right, here we go with that answer. Uh, my name is Will, and uh, I'm a father of two. I have two boys. But I want to know how can we implement some of these programs into the school? How can we bring the Urban League, uh, Dr. King, uh, the other people on the panel into the schools and integrate and work with some of the teachers and the principals and bring some of these organizations into the schools? Thank you. 
four years. We're in year two. But we'd love to have that program in every high school. So we're going to do that. It just takes resources to help us put pressure. And uh, the Joseph Evan Flower Election Series are in that school.
we would never have the 50th anniversary of the March of Washington. So we know that one time is not uh, going to be enough. It's, it's really supposed to be a time where we are re-energized and we focus on what we need to do. And God had to, uh, unfortunately, he sent us a gift. And I want you to hear this because I've had to say this as I thought about the assassination of my father. Uh, the death of Trayvon Martin is a gift to us. It's a tragedy uh, to the parents. But it's a gift because it's God's gift to us to reconnect with the unfinished work of art when we begin.
Someone's wife just went into labor and has a car blocking their car. They try to go to the hospital. There's a green Nissan Maxima uh, tag QN 5068. Please move your car. There's only a baby in the parking lot. Uh, can we give a round of applause for all our esteemed guests on the panel? It's been my honor and privilege to moderate this portion of the show. Before I turn it back over to Ryan Cameron, I just want to leave with this one thing. Everybody under the age of 21 on social media, please put your hands up. If you're on social media, if you tweet, if you text, whatever you do. The message I'm going to convey to you, and I want you to take to your friends, is that you are what you tweet, you are what you Instagram, you are what you text. Serena McFadden had a quote that somebody put on one of my social media things and stuck with me since the verdict. She said, only in America could a black boy be on trial for his own murder. And that was because of things that he might have said or might have tweeted or might have texted. So please remember, while before you press send, that once you put that away, once you send that tweet, when you're gone, that's all people have to go on. There's no asking any questions. You are what you tweet. My name is Big Ticket. Thank you for having me this evening. And I'm turning this back over to my brother, my brother, my brother, Mr. Ryan Hill. Sorry, I'm going to hand the Big Ticket, everybody. for his higher purpose. And if you look around, 
on a rainy evening together to talk about change. Dr. Bernice King sat here and said that the catalyst for why we are here tonight turned out to be a blessing. So first and foremost, I just want to send prayers out to Trayvon Martin's family for their loss. This is their child. At the end of the day, this is their baby. And what most of us see as a, a grave miscarriage of justice. But the truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, is that our justice system is far from fair. Thank you. 
uh, as the sister stated, uh, when they were their mother for the summer. And my, my, my thoughts went immediately to them. And it did because I was nine years old when I saw Rodney King beaten by four cops on the National News Media. And, you know, we all have memories at that time. Of course, our, our community rose up in outrage. Um, but my memories are of this feeling that I had in my chest. In my chest. And you know, I was only nine years old, and as I grew, grew toward manhood, this scenario, uh, what I call it, miscarriage of injustice, played itself out again and again. And it became clear to me that Rodney King was not an isolated incident. Am I right about that? I'm a Dubiala, Sean Bell, Oscar Grant, Eric Stone Williams. We can call the names. It's so important that we connect Trayvon Martin to all the previous Trayvon Martins. And for me, as I grew to a man, this feeling in my chest grew almost like a ball of fire. Uh, heat, really tight. And, uh, as my sons, you know, became two and three and four years old, I decided, okay, I can do something about this. I got to dig into it, uh, figure out what thoughts and feelings are creating this. Uh, and luckily, I, I was born into a family that has been doing this work for years and years. Uh, my father uh, has been a support. And, uh, and so I used the tool uh, that I was taught by my father, and that I'm giving to you all this evening, hopefully to give some service to you all, uh, to help me process what was going on with me. Uh, I want to uh, preface this by saying that we usually present this over a three-day workshop, uh, Healing the Precious Wounds as a sister state. It's a skill-building workshop. Today I got ten minutes. Of course, I got to boil this thing down. Uh, so bear with me. This tool that I use uh, is called the River of Touches, uh, or the Flow of Recognition. And uh, I can imagine that usually I have a, a, a graphic organizer, a PowerPoint that I use to, to, to depict this. But if y'all can imagine with me, um, we are all born into this world uh, into a river of touches. We are shaped by the touches, not, not physical touches now, but uh, the verbal touches, uh, the, the, the relationship interactions uh, that we have with our, our community, with our church groups, our schools, our peer groups, um, the way that people talk, talk to us, the way that people treat us. Uh, we also are shaped by touches that, uh, that we receive from society at large, from the way that we are depicted in the news media, from the images that we see of ourselves on um, these various shows that, that our children might not love and hip-hop and what have And um, it, it's important for us to be able to, to view the way that we're touched and to put them in categories that we can take power over the way that we're touched. Um, follow me. We can be touched in two general ways, right? Positively and negatively, right? We can be touched positively for our doing, for an action that we take. You know, your teacher at school might say, you know, you know, I love the way you wrote that paper. Your mother might say, you know, I love the way you swept the floor last night, right? That's being recognized positively for something we're doing. Or we can be recognized positively for who we are, for our being, for our essence. I love you. I'm glad that you were born. You make my life better. Similarly, we can be recognized negatively for something that we do. I don't like the way we wrote that paper. I don't like the way we swept that floor. Go do it again. Or for who we are. You ugly. You stupid. You powerless. The ultimate negative being touch was this verdict that was passed down just a few days ago. The ultimate negative being touch is to be told that our lives don't matter as black people. Thank <laughs> you. 
revolutionary thing we can do is take power over how we define ourselves, over, over how we value ourselves. Because one of the consequences of living in this place where for generations and for centuries our lives have not been respected, we've been sent these messages continuously, continuously, continuously. And even as we raise children and fought and maintain our dignity, some of the messages got me.
the law of the day said you weren't even supposed to speak. If you were black, you were supposed to jump off the sidewalk. He was from another town and did not know the rules of the South. Uh, they took that young boy and went to his home that evening. Uh, late in the evening, they knocked on his door and said, boy, is that little boy who was down at the corner store, that 14-year-old. Uh, so they took that 14-year-old. They snatched him from his home and kidnapped him. They took him to a barn where they woke him all night. Then they tied a 70 pound anchor from a cotton gin around his neck, threw him in a river, and days later, his body would float to the top of the water. When they shipped his body back to his mama in Chicago, they told her, don't come see him. She said, I want to see my baby. She said, I want to see my baby. And when she went, you can imagine the horrible feeling. And when they showed her, she couldn't even not, she couldn't recognize her own baby. And they said, well, this, until we're going to have a closed casket funeral, because we don't think that anybody should see this. She was very specific. She said, oh, no. Oh, no. I want an open casket funeral because I want the world to see what they've done to my baby. So from Samson Clark, he said, you want the world to see what they've done to Trayvon and maybe if they understand what they did. You would hope that our greatest sister humanity would kick in and we would stay back like the other community and never get in. I'm not so confident in that. So uh, we have to watch as well as pray. But my job here today is to introduce to you uh, our man that's here today. But my job here today is introduce to you uh, a man who's no stranger. You know, Attorney Molly Davis tells me all the time that the law has some limitations. And that sometimes law only work when people get out and agitate and they make the law do what it should do. I was marching on Monday with Reverend Derek Rice from the St. Paul United Church of Christ from the Angel Center to CNN. And I looked at the head of the march and how come the lawyer up there just dropping sweat and just singing with a bull on the chat. And I said, man, that's a different kind of lawyer. Attorney Miley Bell Davis and all these brothers who see a part of the Let's Make Man, uh, he stepped out on faith in 2007 to open the Davis Bolton Law Firm. A lot of people think that I am the lawyer. No, honestly, I am really out on bond right now.
Jay said, all of these presentations are lengthy and we are reducing them to 10 minutes. So this is a snippet. Hopefully it will get you fired up enough to say, we want to come to Let Us Stay Man or you all come to us and we're prepared to do that. But the consequences of love, like, I'm going to need some help. Is everybody all right about that? All right. So I know we're in church, but there's a song, and there's nothing, nothing bad in it, Dr. White. There's nothing bad in it. But there is something bad in it, but there's no curse words. But I'm going to need the young people and some of you old folk to listen as well to help me with the song so I can put the consequences of the life in context. Everybody cool? All right. On this, here we go. I think I'm in reach. I think I'm. Nickname, Reverend Rice can 
can waive that right by saying, I give you consent and permission to search my home. Going to bring it to another level. The Fourth Amendment unreasonable search and seizures, a lot of times we'll see as it relates to being pulled over by the police. And let me preface my statement that I am as honest as I can be as someone who has practiced law and has represented primarily African American men. That the issue of racial profiling does exist. Now, I'm not saying all law enforcement officers do profiling, but there are some who do. And let me tell you how it happens. You may be riding in your vehicle. The officer may see that you have a tail light on. The officer may see that you're not wearing your seatbelt. And what the officer does is he or she will pull you over for what's said to be the legal reason because your tail light is out or because you did not have your seatbelt. However, in the law we call that a pretextual reason. What I mean by pretextual reason is that is not the real reason that the officer pulled you over. But that is the reason that the officer gives to give probable cause or reasonable suspicion to pull you over. Because you need to know the officer just can't pull you over for no reason at all. He has to have some type of probable cause. And a lot of times it's when they've seen you commit some type of criminal offense. So what happens is the officer pulls you over, asks for your driver's license and your registration. What I would suggest to you, when you notice that you have been pulled over, especially as African American men, do not make any sudden moves, do not make it as if you're reaching for something, because those are things that the officer may feel that you're reaching for a weapon. When the officer does come, let him know where your insurance is, your registration, you give him that information. How this pretension will stop and only happens is the officer say, need your driver's license, need your registration. Then what he says is, um, we would know they have a lot of drugs being sold in this area. Do you have any drugs on them? You say, no. You say, you have a problem with me searching your vehicle. At that point, you should say, no. Well, yes, I do have a problem with you searching my vehicle. I do not give my consent for you to search my vehicle. Why do I say that? Because if you, in fact, consent to the officer searching your vehicle, then the fourth amendment that I just read to you about unreasonable searches and seizures does not apply. So, but you need to know that you never give consent to search a vehicle. However, there are some exceptions to that. For instance, if the officer pulls up to your vehicle and you have sitting on your passenger side some type of illegal substance that is a white powdery substance that is bad up for the passenger seat, if the officer sees that, then that's called plain view. That's what we call it. with his plain view, is able to see the illegal substance. Therefore, he doesn't need your consent because in plain view, he sees the drugs, and therefore, he can arrest you to search a vehicle. The second exception is something called search incident to a lawful arrest, meaning if the officer arrests you because he saw that white powdery substance sitting on the passenger seat, once he arrests you, then he has the right to search a vehicle. Another one that gives an officer a probable cause is if the officer walks up to your vehicle and there is a strong aroma emanating from his vehicle that happens to be marijuana, okay? That gives the officer reasonable suspicion and probable cause to search a vehicle. Now, why do I say that? Because I read to you from the beginning the Fourth Amendment that deals with unreasonable search and seizure. Once you be knowledgeable of that, but you can all times waive those rights by consenting or by doing something that goes against one of the exceptions. Another thing I would like to tell you with the interaction with the police officers, if in fact you find yourself in an unfortunate situation where you are being arrested or charged with an offense, as a person who practices law will we tell everyone, when the officer arrests you, he or she will read you something called your Miranda warnings. We'll tell you you have the right to remain silent. and everyone pretty much knows how to go. But any of you that you decide to make statements and the officer um, has not 